Maria Solange Autari was known to her friends by her childhood nickname of Pido, which she told me was regional Italian slang for flea. It had been coined by her older sister, who snapped throughout their childhood to, get out of my hair, you fucking flea, especially when Pito insisted on tagging along with her on her dates. She was 30, and I was 25 when we met during my first year serving in UNICEF's global New York headquarters, and I, along with everyone else, knew who Pito was the day she started working. Half Italian, half French Moroccan, with a foul mouth and wild eyes that were partially lit up by chain smoking and drinking coffee like it was water, the rumors about her started the day after. Some were of a mysterious but benign nature that she had come from royalty on one side of her parentage, though nobody espousing that theory ever clarified exactly which side. Most rumors, though, centered on what she'd done to land such a powerful position as the planning officer in charge of overhauling UNICEF's notoriously incompetent human resources department. None of the rumors took into account her, pro her previous work experience rerouting oil tankers around the globe. They fixated instead on whose cock she'd sucked. My favorite cock to be offered up as a possibility for said suckage <laughs> was the one belonging to my direct supervisor, a man so gloriously yet subtly homosexual that <laughs> The happiest I could ever make him was by coordinating the charts for his weekly intel briefing to match, seasonally, with his wardrobe. <laughs> Every chart should tell a story, they say, and mine said Argyles were back in a big way. <laughs> what made the rumors even uglier, though, was that Peto was one of a baker's dozen of women of color to wield positions of power in UNICEF's HQ. She'd earned her PhD by the time she was my age, 25, because she knew people would look for reasons not to take her seriously and reminded me often. I told her that I would love to get a PhD, but then I wouldn't be able to be around to help her smoke herself to death. <laughs> ah, Justin, I would love to give up smoking, but then I would have to give up sex. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. After two years serving with emergency operations, Pito asked me to be her assistant, and I agreed without hesitation. I'd learned the gift of serving under competent leadership, and I wasn't about to break the streak of luck I'd had up to that point. Plus, Pito's mission was righteous. Moving the right operators around the globe to the places they were needed the most without abandoning them, that was the cornerstone of UNICEF Logistics. And when Pito arrived to rehabilitate the system, the department was helmed by an older Englishman so out of touch that he still referred to Africans and Southeast Asians as natives. <laughs> and who met Pito's suggestions for change with reflexive fear and loathing. Pito was not concerned about keeping the peace, though, or rumors, or even money, and the unwavering 12-plus hour day she poured into making her vision a reality was her diplomatic middle finger in the face of all her, her detractors. The only part of my new role as her assistant that surprised me came from how little work there was for me to do at first. I did fuck all, really out the gate in comparison to the hours I poured into managing the tsunamis and earthquakes and wars I'd been assigned previously. Part of that could be attributed to the fact that our meetings were held exclusively in the alley outside the building because one, Peta was a chain smoker and it turned out that she hired me in part at least to be her confidant. Because you see, her UN aid worker boyfriend was scheduled to return from an overseas deployment just weeks later. And Pito had made it clear to me that until her boyfriend was securely ensconced in her bed, we were not going to do anything of greater risky import. <laughs> Any questions you have to ask me, ask me by lunch, Justin. I am leaving early to get waxed. So the next time you see me, I will be smooth as an eel. <laughs> this was her chance to redeem six months of unwanted celibacy. And because she was such an excellent planner, boyfriend figured very prominently on our shared calendar. 
If you had told me six months ago I would be living in New York City and dating a man in Pakistan, I would tell you to stop blowing smoke at my ass. <laughs> smoke up my ass, I corrected. This is also unofficially part of my job. Sometimes when she wasn't in her office, I would go in to read through a little red journal she kept on her desk explicitly for writing down new English slang she'd intended to master. <laughs> Apples are crunchy, was all she had written that day. <laughs> Your hair, it looks crunchy, she told me later. She wasn't wrong, I was trying a thing, it was a phase, it didn't work out. But yes, blow smoke up my ass if you said I would be in a long-distance relationship in a city full of beautiful, rich men. See, this is the problem. You go to bed with a man on Friday in New York City, he calls you on Monday from Kashmir to tell you he had a nice time. What does a girl do? I don't get excited by machines. I try to get my, tos my toaster to talk dirty to me, but it is shy. <laughs> I started to put my notebook away when she lit another cigarette. They say I get this job because I blow someone. Who would I blow? And for this job, they can blow me. I want to help kids. She caught herself, let go of her anger. She grabbed my chin. I see you in a week, Justin. I will call you if I don't hear from you. But assume I am not wearing pants if I do. <laughs> I am much easier to be around after I get what I want. But there was no week away from Maria Solange. When her vacation was supposed to begin the following Monday, she was already back in the office, and we were smoking again at 9.30 in the morning. I asked her how her weekend with her boyfriend had gone. It was terrible. How, how, how can you be in a bad mood when there's a naked girl who doesn't charge money for sex in the room with you, huh? I think he's unhappy because he has no job now and he's living in my apartment and he feels like he's less of a man because he has no control. But I ask you, if you don't work, is it too much to ask just to cook me dinner and give me sex? I'm okay with this. <laughs> she blew a tight stream of smoke at the ground and shook her head. The last time we see each other, we were in India. Our room was like a palace. There was champagne on ice, and I take a bath in a tub that comes up to my shoulder. I was afraid he was going to drown when he gets in. He is a tiny man, but not everything is proportional, thanks God. <laughs> but then, when I get out of the tub and I wrap a towel around me, I come out, and he is down on one knee with a ring in his hand. I asked her what she did. I kick him in the chin! <laughs> I say, everything is so nice, give me a break. Can we have not one nice day without getting married? Jesus. And then she tap, tap, tap my clavicle. I took the ring though, Justin. <laughs> Always take the ring. <laughs> and I promised her, if anyone ever offered me a ring, I would take it regardless of my intention to marry them. <laughs> and then she tugged on the sleep of the plaid Western shirt I was wearing for casual Friday. I like this shirt, Justin. This is the nice thing about having a small boyfriend. I can borrow his clothes. It became apparent to me that something had gone very wrong when Pito stopped complaining to me about her boyfriend altogether. Our talks became less casual, all business. If there had been any gap in her workaholism before, she sealed it up by pulling all-nighters. She stopped appearing at the party she'd once been the star of, unless it was politically necessary. And even then, she came alone, and she left early. During an ideal fall weekend in New York, I went into a Tribeca boutique to buy a women's near version of the shirt Pito had complimented me on. And then on the way to my stop, I actually spotted Maria Solange walking on the opposite side of the street, and I almost crossed to meet her. I'd raised my hand even to get your attention, but I dropped it as soon as I noticed the man walking with her, or to be precise, behind her. Pito stayed one step ahead of him, smoking, her head turned towards the road. He had his hands in his pockets and he was looking up at the sky at nothing with his face that betrayed pain, anger, shame, all the familiar emotions that lovers become acquainted with once they prepare themselves to become strangers. But it was her expression that stopped me. I had never known Maria Solange to fail at anything. She'd altered the course of institutions that her lessers assumed were impossible to affect. Her private life, though, had slipped through her fingers. 
and her face betrayed that she'd lost something she hadn't been prepared to give up. I couldn't allow her to know that had been witnessed, so I stepped into a storefront until they passed, and I never gave her the shirt. Peter's boyfriend had been out of the country for two weeks before she brought it up at one of our meetings. She flicked her cigarette too hard during the telling and sent a shower of burning embers down into her crotch. Ugh. I know she's not getting any use, but I don't think I should burn her, huh? <laughs> I told her no, probably not. In the past two weeks, my boyfriend has flown away for another contract in the field. My bike has been stolen. And this morning when I buy my coffee, I lay my wallet down on the counter and I walk away. When I come back, it is gone. I had to beg the security guard to let me in the doors today. This is not a very good sign for somebody who's supposed to be a planning officer, eh, Justin? I asked her if I couldn't loan her some cash until she got new cards. And she smiled thinly, still staring down at her cigarette floating between her knees, saying nothing, and I realized I'd said the worst thing she never wanted to hear. You want to go f work in the field very much, don't you? And I did. I really did, but not because I didn't like my job with her, but because I wanted to catch up to her, to be her equal one day, and buy her a drink once I was. And then... Once I'd done that, I could tell her that she deserved to be happy, above all other ambitions she held, and how it hurt me in a way I didn't know yet how to interrogate that she wasn't. Maybe I'd finally give her that goddamn shirt while I was at it. I will write you the letter, Justin. Winter is a very good time to leave New York. I asked her what she was going to do. I will buy a sun lamp. The last time I saw her truly happy was while we were working together in her office. And she jerked at her mouse, which would not budge. What is the problem? She followed the cord down under the desk to where it was trapped under my chair. Ah, Justin, you are sitting on my mouse. <laughs> and then she snapped her head up at me with the delight and surprise of a child. I love this expression. It is such an image. You are sitting on my mouse. <laughs> a month later, through no small push by Pito, I was serving in South Sudan and telling a coworker there about her, about how much I owed and missed her. My coworker asked me if I ever told Pito all of that, and I said I hoped I'd made it known while we had time together what she meant to me. But I decided to sit down that same afternoon and type it all out in an email anyway, just to be sure, and I hit send. She never replied. She never got it. Twelve hours later, I got an email from a mutual friend of ours still working with Pito in New York. She told me how Maria Solange was sitting in her, in her office after hours that Friday evening, exhausted after a week of making an organization that's built to save kids actually be better at saving kids. Our friend interrupted Pito to ask if she didn't want to go grab a drink. And to our friend's surprise, Pito agreed with a caveat. She would cut it off after two drinks, come straight back to the office, and finish this work of hers that had no end. Our friend told me they had an absolute blast together that night, trading secrets, pretending to be scandalized by their own divulgences, and laughing so hard they blew snot. Maria Solange would go back on her word and ordered a third and then a fourth cocktail. They shared cigarettes outside in the cold like boarding school girls, afraid of being caught by their headmaster, shivering, and wondering if anybody they knew would walk by and see them, but not really caring, not really. On the walk back from the bar with our friend, they stopped and they paused together outside of UNICEF HQ. They looked up at that tall metal tower that defined them so much, looming dark and empty over them, and Pito said something that would haunt her friends for the rest of their lives. You know what, Bella? Fuck them. Fuck them. They aren't worth my life. Then, instead of going back to work, they embraced and left for home in opposite directions. No one was with Pito during her brief subway ride after that or when she popped out of her Tribeca station, walked two blocks to her apartment through the chilly February air, and caught a waiting elevator up to her apartment. No one was with her when she reached into her handbag for her keys 
and a blood vessel burst in her exquisite brain. She was found within the hour slumped in the hallway with a gash on her forehead that would be attributed to her striking the doorknob during her fall. Evidence, they said, that she had never been aware of what was happening to her. Her medical team would comment that aneurysms, such as the one Pedo suffered, were caused by a predisposition of genetics, that it was no more influenced by lifestyle or stress than spontaneous combustion. And none of us who knew her fucking believed them. I never dreamt about Maria Solange until I outlived her. It started when I turned 33. And I hope it, hope, I hope it happens more often than it has in the past. I miss her. She looks happy when she visits. And I still have so much to tell her. Thank you. That's Justin Hudnall, everybody.